Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. I must tell you, this podcast is brought to you guys by Gunfighter Gun Oil and Gunfighter Products, available at gunfighteroil.com. D.A. Michaels, that's who we've got on today. You are a author, a police officer, and a naval veteran. Tell us Correct. about it. Well, I, uh, I'm a single mom. I got three pretty hilarious dogs, two shepherds, German shepherds that I uh, keep me very busy. Um, one of which is my service dog. I was diagnosed with PTSD three years ago, which is a lot about what my book is about. It's about overcoming adversity and conquering what we like to call the battle scars of life. Everybody goes through crap. All of us do. Um, those of us who've served in the military or as first responders, we go through more than our fair share. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we know we sign up for that and we take on the job, but we don't realize years down the road, the toll that'll take on us. So it's about, a lot about, um, the adventure of life. There's readers have said, you know, they've laughed, they've cried, but, uh, at the same token, it's, it's about overcoming the, uh, the demons when they catch up to you. And the book is called courageously broken, correct? That is correct. So before we talk about the book, talk a little bit about your life, the parts of it that you or the reader are going to find out about in the book. Of course, you're not going to give the whole book away, but. Right, 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 right. Um, real quick disclaimer. Um, if somebody were to Google my name, Donna Michaels, they're going to find a hot, steamy romance novelist. I just like to put it out there. That is not me, uh, which is Excellent why. I... books, by the way. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I cannot take credit for them. Um and it's ironic that they, one of them or a couple of them, I think, from what I've seen, have been stories about uh, affairs with the Navy SEALs. So I found that to be uh, extremely uh, ironic. But I, I just want the readers or anybody out there listening to know that is not me. I am not the author of those books. So that's why I went with D.A. Michaels. So anyway, um, my book yeah, is about... As Matthew McConaughey said, it would have been a lot cooler if it was. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe... Maybe after I retire, we'll come out with a, a something like down that venture, but we'll see. I don't know. Time will tell. Um, so like a lot of veterans, I joined the military to um, get away from home and see the world. Not only that, but also I was raised with uh, by a very uh, patriotic family. My grandfather... Um, God rest his soul, was a World War II veteran. Um, all of his brothers were. My dad was. His brother was. I'm the first female in my Navy to join the military. But I come from a long line of veterans. And um, so I was raised with that sense of duty and that, and that um, patriotic um, passion. Mm. But with that said, I also came from a kind of a messed up, I mean, dysfunctional family. And... Uh, I joined the Navy because I wanted to get away from it and I wanted to see the world and I wanted to serve my country. And that's what I did. I knew it. I think it was the age of 13. I knew that that's what I was going to do. I honestly didn't think my, my parents were going to be on board with it. So I waited till I was 16 to tell them when I was hundred percent sure it's what I wanted to do. And, and luckily they were, they were quite uh, very, very supportive of me to, to in, in, in joining the military. I think they knew that it was probably my only hope of um, getting anywhere in life. Where'd you grow up? What part of the country? Well, I originally grew up in Florida um, until I was 13. And my parents decided that they wanted to get out of Florida and they bought land on a remote mountain in Western North Carolina. Okay. Um, we like to call it BFE and I'm pretty sure everybody knows what BFE stands for. <laughs> but uh, yeah, really, really remote. There was no, the only neighbors we had were my grandparents, my maternal grandparents. They lived just down the, down the hill. Um, other than that, the closest neighbors were like 17 miles away. So it was, it was very, very remote. Okay. And what did you do when you, we got into the Navy? How old were you when you joined? I was, um, 18. Okay. Yeah. 18. So I know eventually you ended up deployed with some teams, but what, what was your career path? Uh, well, I was a yeoman, which is, okay. um, you know, we're usually assigned to the, the commanding officers of a, of a unit or a base. Um, any administrative tasks or duties that need to be done, that was, that was our job. 
from anything from classified material and managing it and clearances to um, evaluations, awards. I mean, if it had to go on paper, it was going through us pretty much. Um, when I got to my first duty station was the Azores, where I spent 15 months with a aviation uh, facility. Uh, back then, it was 1989. Um, we were still, you know, using submarines to spy on the Russians and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So our aircraft were patrolling the North Atlantic, um, dropping sauna buoys, you know, to do that sort of thing. Um, we worked closely with a unit out of Spain, so. It was really easy to travel Europe from there because the, the planes were constantly flying back and forth. So I got to see quite a bit of Europe while I was, uh, while I was, while I was there for that 15 months. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now I know part of the book, the uh, part that you, in explaining the contents of your life story, you talk about being in Central or South America deployed with a SEAL team for some time, correct? That's correct. When my when it came time for me to get orders um, after as I was leaving the Azores, I told the DSER, I'm like, look, I don't care where you send me, just send me where there's some action. I just want to go. I had this. I've always been a little bit, not a little bit. I've always been a, a adrenaline junkie. The bigger the thrill, the happier I was, and I really, really wanted to go into a combat zone. But back in 1989, 1990, women weren't allowed to go into combat zones. We weren't allowed on combat vessels, destroyers, aircraft carriers, any of those, any of those things. So it was really hard to get to a unit where you could get see some action. Um, it was around about the time that I was getting, that I was looking for orders that Operation Just Cause had just happened in uh, Panama when we took out Noriega. And um, mind you, I didn't know what a Navy SEAL was. I had no idea. I had been around aviation community um, and my dad was a fleet guy and my grandpa was a CB. So I'd never heard of a Navy SEAL. Um, so when I call the detailer and I'm explaining to him, like, look, just send me where there's some action. I, I was trying to get to Bahrain because it was as close as I knew I could get. They just didn't have anything. He says, but we do have something down in Panama. He said, uh, you'd be working with the SEALs. He goes, and they just had that, that conflict down there. He said, uh, things are still, still pretty hot. He goes, and there's billets available for you. I said, all right, I'll take that. So <laughs> I hung up the phone and I, I told my, uh, my office staff, you know, hey, I got my orders. I'm, I'm going to Panama to a, to a SEAL unit. And my exo happened to be walking by and he stopped in his tracks. He's kind of a funny guy. And he goes, seals, you're going to work with seals. And I was like, confused. I go, yeah. And he, or yes, sir. And he goes, whew, you better start doing your push-ups now. And I just, I didn't really understood what that meant. So I started doing a little more research and realized, man, I'm going to work with some badasses. <laughs> I was a little, I was very nervous about it. Um, started running a little bit more, started trying to get in shape because everybody told me that even though you're not an operator, um, you're expected to participate in everything they do. If they're running, you're running. If they're doing pull-ups, you're doing pull-ups. You know, I mean, you got to be side by side with these guys. They don't expect you to keep up, but they expect you to try. So that was a lot of pressure because um, where I was, there wasn't a lot of uh, emphasis on physical fitness. And that was... Uh, I was in decent shape, but I was never an athlete or anything like that. So for me, that was a challenge. Um, How old were you when you went down there? Uh, when I got to Panama, I was 19. Okay. So yeah. Just so in for a year or so when you ended up going down there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So right. I was 19 when I got to Panama and I, and I showed up and um, there are some hilarious stories in the book about what it was like through the eyes of a small town girl who'd been very sheltered, gone to Catholic school hmm. to show up at a Naval special warfare unit with a bunch of commandos um, shirtless out in the jungle. This say again, like the other authors, porno books now. No, 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 not at all. You know, I know I'm, that, joking. I'm just, I know, joke. It was I, joke. I know, I know, I know. Um, it's just that these guys, you know, are nuts. I mean, they, they, have trained to know that at any given day when they're operating, they could die. And they truly live every day like it's their last. And when you have been sheltered your whole life, for the most part, and then you get exposed to that kind of mentality, it is a, it is uh, an eye-opening experience. And it's, uh, it was pretty funny because it didn't take them long to read me and realize that, you know, I was a small town girl and, and had never seen the likes of them before. So uh, there's tell us tell us one of the funny stories. 
Oh my goodness. Um, all right. I'll just tell you the first, first party I ever showed up with. I had, I'd been there maybe a week. Um, been working in the office, just kind of getting to know everybody. And um, first party of many, many parties was that weekend. Um, and the, the philosophy is very much work hard, play hard. I mean, hardest working individuals in the, in the world also know how to, to play hard, equally sure. hard. So um, I get invited to go to uh, my first platoon party and we pull up and I'm with a couple of my, uh, the girls from the, there was only four girls in the whole unit and we all worked in the same office. Um, so we show up and I'm, I'm just getting out of the car when I hear this, you know, roar of laughter and, and, and I look up and I see this dude. Now mind you, this is Panama. So when you go up to a house, the house is built on stilts. So underneath is the parking area. So you walk up a flight of stairs to get to the first level and often there was a second level. So it was very tall building. Um, I look up and I see this, this dude, pure muscle, coming out of the window with his face on fire. Hmm. Um, and he takes a nosedive from a second story window onto the ground below. And that was my first impression of <laughs> SEALs when they're not working. And everybody's laughing, you know, instead of like, oh my God, is he okay? Which is what normal people would do. They're laughing at him. Apparently uh, what he had done, and I, I had just missed this part, is he was trying to like ever clear, you know, as he blew it out of his mouth. Well, the wind blew back. I mean, they were all drunk. The wind blew back, went all over his face. His face lit on fire. And the corpsman, who happened to be his buddy standing there, in the blink of an eye, he grabs the first thing to, to hit him in the face with to try to put the flames out, which was a frozen steak. So he's getting whacked in the face with a frozen piece of meat and decides that jumping out of the window was a better solution. So he took a nosedive out the window, and I guess that was his version of, you know, was it drop, drop, ro roll, and stop, drop, and roll. That was his version of stop, drop, and, and roll. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So... You finish up your time in the Navy, you come back to the States, you get a job in law enforcement, which is what you're doing to these days, right? That's correct. Yep. 20 so years. At what point do you decide I need to write a book? What talk, talk about the impetus to writing a book. Uh, well, in telling stories of my life over the years, I've been told countless times, you need to write a book. Your life is crazy. And I just laugh it off like, yeah, okay. When I find time, which I never have. Um, but three years ago, like I said, when I got diagnosed with PTSD, I went into a really, really dark place and, and I've never been like that before. Never suffered from depression, you know, always been credited with being very resilient, you know, despite adversity. Mm. Uh, and then all of a sudden I wasn't, and I, I um, was not handling it well. And I knew with a I knew what the consequences of talking to somebody about it was, and they terrified me. So like many, I wouldn't talk. So I said, I really Just withdrew. For, for the listeners, when you're talking about consequences, you're meaning with your job. Yes. Um, Sudden you get I was of the, somebody that's unstable or something. Right. Now you're not able to go to work. Right. Oh, yeah. You have the... You have the image, in, the image in your head of, you know, the handcuffs, the Baker Act. We call them Baker Acts in Florida. You know, the Baker mm -hmm. Act getting hauled off to the mental hospital. And, you know, even if it's supposed to be confidential, you know it's not. People find out. And, right. and then the stigma of it. And then you think they're going to take that's it. They're going to take my badge, my gun. And at that point, I had 17 years in on the job. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to lose it. I, you know, I just, I just was terrified. Terrified. And I know I wasn't alone. I mean, now, learn, knowing what I know now that I didn't know three years ago, I realized... There's a lot of people like that. We, a lot of us go through that, you know, and, yeah. and some actually do commit suicide. Um, in fact, far too many do. I was looking at the sure. statistics this morning. Um, in 2019, 333 first responders committed suicide. That was 19. I can't even imagine what it's going to be for 2020. Yeah, it's, it's huge. It is. It is. And it's 22, you know, average of 20 to 22 veterans a day. And that's even higher numbers. But the problem with first responders is it's not tracked like it is veterans. So it could be much more. We don't know. Those are the ones that have been reported. Mm -hmm. Many go unreported. Um, so anyway, it's it's a real problem. And were, I almost were became. Were you in that dark of a spot that you? Were... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was. I was in that. I was so deep in that hole. I couldn't. I could not even begin to figure out how to get out of it. I had. I had tried every trick in the book that I knew, um, and I couldn't. 
I couldn't find it. I was, yeah, it was bad. So, um, I, uh, I made that phone call to my closest friend, the only person I trusted, um, who much, who I write about a lot in the book. My, you know, everybody has their person. This is my person. Okay. And I, uh, I called him and I did not expect him to answer the phone. He was horrible about answering his phone. I intended to leave a voicemail. And uh, unsurprisingly, he, he answered. And I was caught off guard by him answering. Because in my mind, I thought I was going to be leaving a voicemail. And he answered, and I just lost it. I just burst into tears. I mean, I was, I was hysterical. I couldn't breathe. He had to calm me down. He couldn't even understand anything I was trying to say. And then I finally mustered the words um, that uh, were on the forefront of my mind. And I just, uh, they were the words I was afraid to say, but they were the truth. And he was the only one I could trust with them. So he's like, whoa, whoa, no, we're not going to be doing that today. So he spent the next eight hours on the phone convincing me that uh, there had been uh, many of our peers who had felt the same way, had been in the same place, and who had reached out for help and are doing much better. He said, you don't hear about it. He said, but trust me, this isn't the first time I've had this current conversation with someone. He goes, and I, you know, so um, he convinced me that I needed help and that he promised me that he would not notify the authorities as long as I promised to keep my as long as I kept my promises to him that I would get help and check in with him on a daily basis, which, you know, we did for quite a long time. Um, well, actually we still do. Um, that was three years ago and not, we don't check in now because of that. We just, we just check in with each other because it's become a habit. And I think it's just, um, it's a good habit that we need, um, to just know each other are okay. If that makes any, it's a buddy check is what sure. it is. Um, yeah, and it, it's very helpful. And I tell anybody out there, if you notice somebody struggling, don't be afraid to don't be afraid to check on them. Because I'll tell you, my closest friends that knew I was going through a difficult time, nobody was checking on me. And I strongly believe that the reason they weren't checking on me is because they were afraid of what I was going to say, because mm -hmm. they didn't want to be the one to make that phone call or that decision. Yeah. Um, because what if they're wrong? Now they cost me my career, right? So I, I don't blame them. I don't fault them. Um, but I do try to tell people, you know, be willing to listen because it's when it's when nobody answers the phone and it's when nobody's there to listen that the, the worst case scenario happens because yeah. they feel like they've been abandoned. So um, anyway, um, where were we going with this? Oh, the book. So, yeah. I can, so, I can ask you more questions, too, if it, if it helps you. But, yeah, you were telling us what the impetus was to you sitting down and drafting a book about your life. Well, I didn't sit down to write the book. That's the mm -hmm. point. I sat right. down. So you're going, you're going through this, this life changing experience. Where right. I went through it. Yeah. Oh, I went through it. Um, I, in hindsight can look back and say that so many people and opportunities were put in my path for a reason, um, that I did not recognize at the time, but that certainly, certainly, um, are to be credited for helping me get going in the right direction. Um, I call them, you know, unexpected angels. They come in all shapes and sizes. You never know. So, so this a course of events happened over the next year that helped me get stronger and stronger and stronger and in a better place. Um, went through VA counseling. I got diagnosed. You know, I, I reached out to the VA, got help. Went through counseling. Um, some other opportunities came along outside the VA, and then it was in a counseling session that I said to my counselor. You know, look, I can understand because I struggle with my memory. And I think I don't, I've talked to a lot of other people with PTSD and, and we all say, oh, yeah, my memory sucks. I, can't, I walk in the room, I can't remember why I'm there. Or I can't remember details of things I should remember details too. Mm -hmm. um, so I was talking to my counselor about that. And I said, hey, listen, I said, I go to two reunions a year, one in the spring and one in the fall. I said, and I'll be sitting around, I'll be hearing old stories. I said, and I know I was there. And I said, I get so frustrated because these are memories I would like to remember. These are funny stories that I would like to enjoy. And why, why can't I remember them? And she said that uh, often when we compartmentalize bad things, 
we accidentally suppress good things. So they kind of get stuffed in the box with it. So I'm like, well, I want to enjoy this stuff. I want to go to these reunions and I want to, I want to feel the laughter and the joy that everybody else is feeling when these old stories come up. So she suggested journaling. She says, when you get to something, cause I would have like snapshots in my brain of a memory, but I couldn't remember details. She said, when you get to one of those points, she says, call someone that you know was there. Cause she knows over the last 30 years, I got out of, I got off active duty in 1993. And I can tell you that to this day, you know, 27 years later, my closest friends are those I served with in Panama. We're family. So what I can do is I can pick up the phone call or send an email and say, hey, listen, do you remember anything about this? And they go, oh, yeah, I remember that. And they'll help me fill in the pieces. So mm -hmm. it was like sitting down, putting a jigsaw puzzle together with a really good friend and putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And it was helping me get my memories back. So I started journaling about this. Well, as I got um, quite a ways into it, I reached out to that, that person, my person, and I said, hey, um, I'm going to send you this. I said, I want, your, I want your thoughts on it. So I sent it to him, and he read it. And at this point, he was at about what would now be chapter five, I think, five or six. Um, and he emailed me back, and he said, wow. He goes, this is awesome. This is bringing back a lot of memories for him that were, were good and bad, a little bit of both. He's like, but man, I forgot about a lot of this. He goes, you know, keep going. You're on to something. So I did. So I got through all the memories and then I got to the part where I broke. And then it was, okay, now I need to write about how I got to where I am now. And I did that. So it was my journey. And I, uh, I sent it to him, what would have been chapter by chapter. And he just kept telling me, keep going. I think this is not only helping you because it was all of a sudden I was feeling like true happiness I hadn't felt in a really long time. And it was because of the voids in my head and a lot of my questions were getting answered because I started wait, realizing, oh, well, if this event hadn't happened, then that event would have happened. And mm -hmm. I can see now like that, you know, the blessings that were in disguise, you know, um, and it was really, really cathartic. And I, uh, my journal turned into a book is what happened because I sat on it for a bit. I discussed it. Um, with some folks and I said, you know, cause there's some, there's some really personal details in this, in this book that which I have is, never, which is why you are writing under a writer's name. The name that we are sharing is not your real name. That is correct. And it is for my, not only my privacy, but my family's privacy, as well as the people in the book. Um, there are some extraordinarily personal stories in there that I am sharing outside my very small circle of trust. Um, for the sole purpose of reaching out to those who may have similar deep personal stories that they struggle with. And it's to let them know that, listen, none of us are perfect. None of us are saints. Um, and we all make, you know, we all make mistakes or decisions in our life that um, we may struggle with, but we have to first and foremost forgive ourselves for these decisions or incidents, and we have to um, move past them and and learn from them, you know, because the old saying goes, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. And that's really what it's about. It's about accepting ourselves for our faults and, and the things, and some of the things aren't even our fault. Some of the things that have happened to us um, are completely not our fault, but I can tell you firsthand that um, one of the worst things that's happened to me was, absolutely no fault of myself fault of my own but i still carry guilt for it and it's mm. it's guilt i'm going to carry for the rest of my life and there's then you know it is what it is and that's another reason for the book because i want other people to understand you know if they've gone through similar things they're not alone a lot of us go through this i think you can ever lay that down i mean I, I don't have the same path as you but there's been all kinds of things in my life that i'm pretty open about like abuse that uh has colored the way that I think sometimes and colored the way that I view and interact. But the way I think about it in my forties is different than the way that my brain computed in my teens or twenties or sure. points in my life. Kind of separate myself from events rather than. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't fault myself for the incident. I, I don't feel guilty for the incident. It, it is what it is. Um, I, I fault myself, partially, well, I'm getting better with this one. I, I, I fault myself for how I handled it, 
Hmm. I carry, I carry some guilt there, but I understand I was, I was young and, and didn't have the gift of hindsight. Right. So I, I get that. I, I just wasn't as mature as I am now. Um, but my biggest regret, uh, or guilt was I could have saved others. I could have talk, saved others. Talk about that some. I know we're not going to go into every detail of the book because we want people to buy it and read it. But if we're just talking in like generalities, nobody's going to have any idea. What okay. Talking about. No, it's fine. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's a domino effect. If I had done this, then maybe nobody else would have got hurt. If I had done this, then maybe there would have been justice and nobody else would have got hurt. Um, but I kept my mouth shut. And what we're talking about, I'm assuming, is you're you didn't speak out about somebody that that hurt you or abused you. So then looking back, because you didn't, you may have been able to stop further trauma from yeah. others. Because because if if what happened to me was as bold as it was, and it was very bold on on the, their part, um, there has to be others. I don't know, but I. I Having now 20 years in law enforcement and carrying the experience that I have of, of a law enforcement officer, I, I, I would bet everything I have, there are others. And I worry, you know, I can't do anything about the ones before me, but how many were there after me? Hmm. And, and I don't know if I will ever, ever regret, I mean, ever, ever not regret handling it differently than I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's just because that's who I am. You know, why did I become a cop? Because, you know, I didn't know I, it's funny when I became a cop, I thought I was becoming a cop because I wanted an adrenaline rush. I had been skydiving for three years, pushing all envelopes to the, you know, to the very edge. Um, and I was turning 30 and I, and I felt like it was time to grow up and get a real job. So somebody talked me into law enforcement. Wasn't, it was so, so far down on my radar of what I thought I was going to do with my life, but somebody came along and talked me into it and, I went out and I did a ride along and it was one of the coolest nights ever, you know, like one adrenaline rush after the other. So I was chasing the adrenaline rush. And, um, but in hindsight, I realized in, in counseling, it wasn't just the adrenaline rush because honestly, those are, you know, those don't, those don't happen every single night, you know, or back to back or constantly. It was the, um, it was that duty uh, or that um, opportunity to help others. What I loved about the Navy and where I served, other than the camaraderie, camaraderie will always be number one, but I also have always been passionate about, um, I'm very anti-drug, never done drugs, never want to do drugs, just, you know, and being part of the drug war in the, you know, in the early 90s, which was the Central and South America mission, I felt like I served, I was part of a team that served the world and made the world a better place. You know, if we could get rid of drugs, then we could make the world a better place. The drugs are the root of all evil, right? Well, at least they are in my eyes. Um, so I felt, so when I got into law enforcement, I, I think I was also looking for an opportunity to make the world a better place, help others. Subconsciously, looking back now, I realized I wanted to help victims like me. I wanted to do for others what didn't get done for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that consciously, but in hindsight and counseling, I, I learned that, that that was another reason for... I think not only getting into law enforcement, but probably staying with it as long as I have. So let's go back to being a kid, because I think you talk about that in the book too, right? Yep, sure do. And that colored your life into present day, I, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. as it does for all of us. Absolutely. Is there, um, maybe tell us a couple stories about, about childhood that you share in the book, just so we understand <laughs> what. Well, this is a funny story. Okay. Uh, and I'm only, this come to my mind first, cause I happened to just post about it yesterday as we were decorating our Christmas tree. So I have an ornament that goes on our Christmas tree every year. And uh, it's the one single ornament I look forward to because I was only in kindergarten when this happened and I remember it and it's always a good laugh. I went to Catholic school, like I mentioned, we had nuns, mm -hmm. you know, old school. And uh, I've never been the artistic type at all. Hate it, never liked it. And apparently my mom, I'm just like my mother, which is kind of funny because my mom said she hated it too. And I'm sitting there in kindergarten and we've got these cute little ceramic ornaments that we're supposed to be painting. And our, uh, our nun, our sister was 
you know, now everybody paint your ornaments for your mommies, you know, make your mommies really happy, make them proud. And I'm sitting there all scorned with my arms crossed. I am just in absolute digging my heels in. I ain't doing it. I just wasn't feeling it that day. And I was being stubborn. Now, mind you, I was, I was a good kid. I really didn't get in trouble at school, but for some reason that day was not a good day for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the sister just keeps bugging me. Now, Donna, you paint that angel. And she's just over my shoulder, you know, giving me that, that finger and whatever. I looked up at her in what was described as quite defiant. I grabbed the angel and I dunked it in the closest bucket of paint that was near me. And it was red. And I dunked it and I pulled it out and I laid it down and I went there. It's painted. And uh, I still have that red angel. And I absolutely like we, we, my mom and my daughter and I last night were decorating the tree. And as soon as the angel came out of the ornament box, we all just started laughing. I mean, we love that story every year, you know, it's cause fantastic that it made it to all these years. Yep. Yep. We sure did. Sure did. Still have it Playing on my phone. I'm pulling something up that I had was reading earlier about your book. So I want to, uh, read your overview of the book so people know what this is okay because you're really speaking in like uh some deep and wide generalities <laughs> well i want people to read the book of course but <laughs> i've been told there's, don't there's get too previews, much away and there's, there's previews i've got a couple friends that are best-selling authors that have been on before and they talk I mean, you don't tell the whole plot, but you got to, yeah. you know, I, mean, no, I wouldn't walk into a bookstore and just buy a blank sheet of paper. That's true. Right? That's true. I don't know what's and I am new to this. So I do appreciate the coaching. So we're working it. So it says, uh, this is, I'm assuming you type this. Everyone yes. has a story to tell in Scars That Don't Heal. A young idealistic teen leaves a small town and an abusive father behind to join the Navy in a refreshingly down to earth memoir of one woman's journey of self-discovery. She embraces life with passion and courage from training and partying with Navy SEALs to skydiving and joining a police force. But when tragic events while serving her country lead to years of nightmares, depression, and PTSD, she must learn to navigate life through the heartache and tears until the laughter and love return. I do see here you've got uh, like some reviews online and here's one that looks like it may have been a CEO of yours. And he said, I was Donna's commanding officer while she was in Panama serving with the Navy SEALs, which is a great part of her story. She was a fun-loving young petty officer, well-liked and well-respected in our command. She was always willing to take on new challenges such as volunteering to be opposition forces to support our tactical SEAL training operations. Her recollection and description provided some funny and scary moments in her story. When we both left that great command where we all served together as family, I was truly excited to learn how she'd taken her courage and commitment to service in law enforcement after leaving the Navy. Hers is a compelling story of how the strength of character in a young woman takes hardship and challenge and turns them into confidence and power in service to others. It's not only a great and fun read, it's also an inspiring story of an American patriot at the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century. Bob Schultz? Schultz. Schultz. Yep. Bob Schultz. Oh, he, Bob I've Schultz. Never seen, it, never seen it spelled that way. S-C-H-O-U-L-T-Z. Captain, United States Navy, retired. So there's a bunch of good reviews there. Um, and I'm not trying to sell your book for you, but we do want people to buy and read it because the whole point of you writing it was so that people that like if they don't know what what the medicine's for, then there's no right. like if, if it's not if it's not for them, then they're not going to buy it. But um, I, I'm I'm assuming uh, everybody listening, not everybody, but most everybody I've found in my life has some like tragic tale from their youth. The interesting thing is some of those are horrific in nature, and some of them are like, oh, your dog died when it was 14 right. years old, and it, you know, and it affected you terribly, but it's quite staggering how many people I come into contact with and we have candid conversations here, but uh, in, in training camps and things of that nature, we do quite a bit of talking and opening up and there are tons of adults that have stories that are about violence in their home or violence in the workplace or uh, it, just terrible things that happen to them as young people. And, sadly 
uh, as you alluded to, you go on with life, but that stuff filters into oh, every for sure. part of your life. It's kind of sure. like that paint that you dip the ornament in, like it gets in everything. It's yeah. Colors, it's it's, it colors it's such a silly, stupid story, but you know, it's for some reason, you know, for me, that's a good memory. Um, I'll, Did I'll none beat you for doing that. Oh Lord, no! She just <laughs> walked. She just walked away, shaking her head, you know. And 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 it turns out, I you know, I found out later in life that a lot of the things that we as young children did that you know were bad mm. that gave the nuns a good laugh at the end of the day. You know, you'll never believe what they did today. You know, kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. But um, you know, a little bit about my childhood as far as you know touching on what you just said is uh, my father was a paranoid schizophrenic and uh, you know, he was the type that when he believed something as ridiculous as it was, there was no change in his mind. Mm -hmm. There was no change in his mind, but he was a very, very intelligent man. And he knew not to discuss um what we later believe were probably voices in his head. Like, mm. like he was cognizant that having voices in his head was a bad thing, but he was smart enough not to tell anybody about it. Wow. But the voices we, we believe, you know, were the ones th that convinced him of the most ridiculous things you've ever heard in your life. And uh, it's weird when you're, I was an only child. And um, it's weird when you're growing up in a house like that you perceive the world to be much like your immediate family. Like that's your bubble. That's all, you know, I've had and these conversations with people where I remember being around other kids. And I thought the things that I was exposed to were the things that every kid was exposed to and talking yep. about it with a classmate. Once I remember him horrified and I'm like, well, I wonder what goes on at their house. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it was when I got to be a teenager and would do sleepovers at friends' houses and saw how their families interacted, Interacted, I realized my family was nothing like that. Right. Nobody's nothing like there. that. Say again? I had a, I had a close family uh, relative, that, a grandmother actually, that was schizophrenic and manic and She'd go through all, she was very much a part of our daily life for until I was in my 30s. But I have memories of me having to get out of bed and wrap a blanket around her because she'd be naked <laughs> walking around the house and take her to, uh, you know, see the, the doctor in the morning because it was that or police would have to come because she'd be violent. So I get, you know, some of what you're saying. Right. Now imagine if you were in that environment and you didn't know that there was something wrong with your grandma mentally. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And that was well, my situation. My father had never been diagnosed. It wasn't until I got out of the Navy and he nearly killed my mother that I was the one that had him, uh, got him into a hospital and got him assessed when he got his diagnosis. So my whole life, I just thought my dad was an asshole. But he was a crazy asshole. I had no idea, that, you know, I didn't even know what mental illness was. Sure. So, yeah. Sure. Is he still alive? No, he passed away in 2008 in a state mental hospital. Wow. Yeah. Did he ever uh, recover or get improved after being treated or medicated? No. No, because he was in absolute denial that there was anything wrong with him. I see. So he learned how to play the game, say what he needed to say to get out, and then he'd go right back to the way he was. Man, mental illness is pretty heavy. I, it, a lot of people view it as some taboo thing, just like PTSD or, or trauma that comes from abuse or, or um, you know, other tragedies and traumas that happen in, in our in our life. But it's, I have one doctor friend, actually, it's a good podcast that I'll send to you. Uh, he's a flight surgeon, and he now works in research for PTSD and has some pretty amazing studies that they that they've done but um they look at it just like a broken elbow or a mm -hmm. punctured lung or a, a torn ligament it's it, and that's some of the things that he's working on is rewiring those those fried synapses and those you know those those parts that the 
you know, I don't, I'm not a brain. To, That's so. okay. I'm following yeah, you because you I've know, done a lot of research now. Yeah, you, so. yeah, you, know, you know what I'm saying. Though. They're, yeah. they're working to get those parts wired back up to work like they're supposed to again. And it's, uh, you know, we get, the ta get rid of the taboo part of it because nobody wants to be identified. Nobody has a problem saying, yeah, I, I, I have to have shoulder surgery, but nobody wants to say I'm seeing a therapist because right. I'm suicidal or I'm clinically depressed or right. you know, something like that. Because it's... I, Go ahead. I think the best analogy I've heard, and I've used it um, with um, others who are struggling asking for help, is think about if you broke a bone years ago mm -hmm. and you never got it set, you never got it casted, you never got it treated, you let it just heal itself. Yeah. And I'm talking like, you know, a major bone, right? Not a broken toe. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't, and it's gonna heal, it's not gonna heal correctly. And that is that injury is going to bother you for the rest of your life because it did not heal properly. Yeah. Now, what happens is when you finally get help and you go get counseling, Let's say, let's say you, you did that. You, you broke the bone. You never got it set correctly. You never got it treated. Years pass, and it's just killing you, and you go to get help. What's going to happen is the doctor is going to re-break that bone, and it is going to hurt like hell. But this time they're going to fix it, and they're going to line it up, and they're going to set it to where it can now heal properly. And now, yes. That injury will always be there, but you're going to be able to live with it because it's not going to be killing you like it was all those years before. Yeah. That's what it's like with, with when someone goes through a traumatic event and never got treated. So mm -hmm. um, in law enforcement, I'm, I'm a member of what we call, uh, we call it CISM for short, which is critical incident stress management. So this is, you know, something that is fortunately uh, PTSD is now becoming much more recognized in um, the first responder community, firefighting and EMS and, and law enforcement. And what we do is anytime there's a traumatic event, um, and it could be anything from an officer involved shooting to an officer of death, child death, horrific car crashes, anything that's just really, you know, above and beyond the norm, routine call. Um, what we do is we get with the, the first responders that responded to that call uh, within 24 hours of the event and we do uh, a quick introduction. This is who we are, this is what we do, here's our phone number. If you're you know, having trouble sleeping, if you're finding yourself withdrawing, you know, we give them a whole list of the things, you know, the red flags mm -hmm. they need to be on the lookout for, give us a call, it's completely confidential. Yeah. You know, the best thing you can do is talk about it and you're not alone, every single one of us has been there. And it's, um, and that's, you know, it's something that is, is still growing and still taking, you know, taking off you know, with more and more agencies that cross the nation. Yeah, we do that up here too. Right. And it's, um, and it's so that, that, that broken bone doesn't heal incorrectly. We're trying mm -hmm. to, we're trying to, you know, set it before it, it causes problems down the road. Yeah. You know, sometimes I think people like, it's interesting. You'll hear people like our parents age say, oh, when I was a kid, men came back <laughs> from war and they just went to work and they didn't talk about it. And I'll listen to that. Like I, I'm a great let me rephrase that. I am an avid student of history. I don't want to say great because I like to see things for what they were rather than what we remember them to be. And it's like, well, uh, domestic abuse was through the roof through those years, for example. Uh, alcoholism, drugs, things like that skyrocketed across America. Sexism in the workplace, uh, hate crimes to people of color and uh, of different sexual persuasions and stuff was completely normal. It's like it wasn't any better. It was just like suppressed and all rechanneled into some other awful place. And yes, some people deal with trauma differently, but we talk in our training programs that that effect of uh, highly traumatic stuff, be it abuse as a kid or a mangled body at a car crash that's a normal response for the human brain it's like can't take this it goes against like our our code of living the things that we accept and shit gets short-circuited it's a, it's mm -hmm. and i think when we remember that in a and just uh 
it demystifies it a little bit. I'm not broken. This is literally because we are raised in such a sheltered way. None of us are mm -hmm. killing our own food. We're not out bludgeoning the neighboring tribe. Oh my God. You are so hitting on something I touch on in my book. Cause I am, a, I talk about it. I'm like, talk about okay. It. I haven't, I haven't read it yet, but I will, I, I will, I promise. So this is just me. This is just my two cents, my theory. Um, I ask myself, I go, so my grandfather, you know, was in Guam. Um, he used to tell stories about the Japanese picking them off, you know, from the trees and stuff like that. And you think about the guys that were in Normandy and, and World War II and in Europe. And I mean, they saw horrific things, you know, they're horrible. And they came back and they got married and had children. And you're absolutely right. Yes, there was a lot of alcoholism. There was domestic violence. But you didn't see this, this suicide epidemic. I mean, I'm not saying there weren't any, but I don't think it was anything like it is now. So what's the difference between that generation, which we know as our greatest generation, right? And our current generation. My theory is that that generation went through the Great Depression, where like you just said, they hunted for their own food. They starved. I mean, they got sick. Family members died. Um, then they went through World War II and, and all kinds of horrible, horrible things. That was a much, much tougher generation. If you got in trouble at home, you got your ass beat. I'm not talking about child abuse. I'm talking about just a good old fashioned ass whooping, right? Because you smart math parents or didn't do something you were supposed to do or got a bad grade on your report card or whatever it was. You got an old fashioned butt whooping. Sure. And they, you know, as a result, developed a tougher exterior, right? So that when they I did- agree with, I would agree with most of that. I have heard of one study, the guys that founded Mission 22 are friends of ours. Um, I've heard one study where some one doctor, I forgot the author's name, he says there was a, that same instance of suicide, but often it was a prolonged uh, uh, death, like, over drinking like my grandfather who was right. a Korean War vet passed away at 40. You got to drink a lot to die at 40 Heck years yeah. old from from cirrhosis. So I never met him of course, but um I remember my other grandfather who was sober late in life. I would had visited the VFW that he was a member of. He was a naval veteran himself. Those guys lined up in those bar stools and yep. I mean, just the history of America or the world in general, we consumed lots of booze and you wonder if uh, I'm not, I don't, I think it was a natural part of, of our existence for lots of reasons, all of that type of. Uh, oh, it was behavior. just, it was socially acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not I mean, my grandfather all because of badness, no. but it was like a, Hey, I, life sucks. Let's go get a buzz. It, right. It right. Yeah, and it was also socially acceptable. I mean, my mom will tell you both my parent, grandparents were alcoholics. You know, my grandmother was a nightclub singer and working in nightclubs, you drink booze. You know, grandpa was a World War II vet and came, they, he loved his beer. Um, mm -hmm. He lived to be 88 years old, yeah. you know, and smoked like a chimney his entire life. Go figure. Yeah, but I, that I was, for, the, they were just tough ahead. back then. They were just yeah. tough. You know, I'm not saying that, they defy the odds of, of the statistics. I just, um, I don't, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not even going to try to go, go down that health path, path right? Why, why do some people like yourself say they drank themselves to death at the age of 40 and then some live to be well into their 80s when mm -hmm. they did everything they weren't supposed to do? I don't know, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but I look at the, you know, when I say suicide, I mean intentionally, yeah. you know, taking themselves out right because of the apparently the there was head. a high instance of that after the civil war and world war one it was just looked at and reported there was no there was no governmental institutions documenting right. lots of that but um, i agree with you i think it's much more i've many friends uh, every i've got many friends that are special operations guys and every single one of them has a list of friends who have taken their own life yes. in the last 15, 20 years. So yep, exactly. growing up, I did not have friends that had lists of friends that had killed them. Right. So until, right. until, but then again, it, during World War II, and I don't want to sideline the point of your book, the war went from 41 to 45. 
we've been fighting for 20 years now, guys deploying at a pace mm -hmm. of years and years and years. I know guys, one of them was on over a thousand direct action hits in a special mm -hmm. operation unit. Like some guys, they do that two or three times in their entire life. And it's, Oh yeah. Take, and the difference between the difference between this current generation of these guys going overseas and, and going into combat, like you just described versus the older generations is this current generation. I don't piss off a lot of people when I say this, but we grow up softer. You know, there's a huge generation there. Their parents never laid their hands on them. I'm not yeah. saying that that's wrong or right. I'm just saying I, I, that's I, I the way it saying. is. It's just an identification of what they is. played video games and they thought that's what war, you know, Call of Duty. They thought that's what war looked like. You know, it's a video game. But when you're actually there in the middle of it, it's not a video game. It's got a whole different thing. And I think what that does to the brain, because the brain perceives combat to be this. And then when you're in the middle of it, you find out your brain wasn't prepared for that. It got, it got wired to think differently. And now all of a sudden it's, you, I don't think it just knows how to process it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're selling your book. I'm going to tr track back to this and your intention. Let's you, you want other folks that have gone through similar journeys where they had traumatic, traumatic, mm -hmm. uh, events in their life to be able to glean from it and find not just not just hope but possibly ways that they can get their life back to a better place themselves courage i want them to find the courage to to get to get help because I'll that that that's, well it's like i said before i mean the fear of losing your you know your identity for a lot of a lot of people that's their identity the mm -hmm. fear of you know having your gun and your badge shaken for you and the humiliation that goes with it and you know, even though it's supposed to be confidential, it, 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 it rarely is. The whole world's going to find out that you, you know, got hauled off to the mental hospital, or at least your whole world is going to find out. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, an, you know, for a lot of people, that fear is real. So what I want people to know is before it gets that bad, before it gets to the point where, you know, you're looking at pulling the trigger because you're so afraid of asking for help, get help before then. When you see yourself starting to go down that, that rabbit hole, where the darkness is starting to set in and you're not doing very well, i.e. you're having nightmares, you're not able to sleep, you're, you know, lashing out at your loved ones um, or whatever the case may be, you know, that's the time to get help. Don't wait until it's completely, you know, sent you so far down the rabbit hole that you're, you're on your floor, you know, hysterically crying. I think that's the problem a lot of people with mental health conditions have because you you feel a certain way and then you don't want to you either medicate it because it doesn't feel good or you push it away because who wants to to you don't want to deal with it yeah square up with that that's a right pretty, uh, a pretty serious thing i did some training a number of years ago for suicide prevention it's called qpr uh question, persuade, refer. And it was basically like uh, very basic first aid for mental health is really how I would, how I would uh, list it. It was identifying, and this is free to anybody in the public, but it was identifying signs or symptoms. And it wasn't, you didn't try to counsel people. That wasn't the point of it, but it was seeing everybody that's ever lost somebody they say man i didn't think about it or that that happened i should have known when i saw that 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 was a sign and so it's helping people just understand and really like the crux of it is just like you said earlier paying attention to your friends or family and calling um we recently had a friend that's going through some stuff and another buddy called me and said hey man i called local law enforcement to pick him up and I'm like, oh, wow. You know, he told me what happened. And I said, well, he sounds like you did the right thing. Well, of course, this guy's really upset because he's a professional uh, in a career that it could screw his life up. And he's angry. And I said, you literally told our friend that you were thinking about taking your life. You know, I wasn't laughing at him. I go, what were we to think? What did you expect? Yeah, I was he just going to say, I'm going to go back and watch the game. But uh, where yeah, that, that's a heavy responsibility. Yeah, yeah. I said, well, you know, I said, I said, we, if you cared about your friends, you wouldn't put that on them. I said, so as far as by that, I mean, you, if that was, you wouldn't make some shit up like that. 
if you right. care about your friend and if we know you you wouldn't make some shit up like that right so care about you so he you know now you're you're in some therapy so life is good you can get better but um and what happened to him professionally i think he's gonna be okay I yeah think he's gonna be okay but um the long and the short of it is it comes down to just paying attention and like you said mm -hmm. a lot of people they're like hey you know like even i care about this person like that's a big mess i don't want to make a phone call and ruin her life or ruin his life mm -hmm. so then you do nothing and then you find the person hanging in their garage or right but here's here's the other point in my book it's not just to get others who've been through crap to you know to get help but i have found in my line of work um people I encounter that are not in my circle, that don't know me personally, that don't know my story, um, have, you know, come to me about other situations unrelated to me, just talking and say, mm -hmm. oh, he's unstable. He was, you know, he was in Iraq and he's got PTSD and he, you know, we're afraid he's going to come in here and do go, go on a shooting spree. And it's like, seriously, because a lot of people have no idea what PTSD really is. And the media yeah. certainly doesn't help, right? Every time something horrible happens in this country and they find out the guy was a veteran, they automatically label it, oh, well, he did it because he has PTSD. And that is so far from the truth. So trust me, yeah. people with PTSD, the only ones they want to hurt themselves. They don't want to go on killing sprees, right? So um, the thing is, is number one, I would want to erase the stigma. I want to educate the general public of what PTSD really is. And what they can do, first of all, to understand it and, and help. Um, I, uh, I shoot, I lost my train of thought. We were talking about, um, oh, I've had a lot of reviews from uh, family members of veterans and first responders that have bought the book and have, you know, hit me up privately going, oh, my God, thank you because their loved one won't talk about it. So they don't understand. They, they glean some understanding of what's going on in mom or dad or whoever. Husband, wife, yeah, yeah, exactly. They've said, oh my God, this helped so much because now I understand why they reacted this way to whatever situation, you know, because we, you know, we're all hypervigilant, you know, we don't trust anybody. We, a lot of us, including myself, the short fuses, lose, we go from, you know, I, I, I'm, I do real good now um, holding my temper better than I used to. But if I get put into a fight or flight situation and I can't walk away from the situation that's pissing me off, if I get cornered, then the fight's on. And it could be something petty and stupid, but it's, it's that, you know, for some reason I get triggered and, and if I don't, if I'm not able to walk away from the situation, go cool off and come back to it, level-headed then odds are i'm gonna i'm gonna fight back and it's gonna and i'm probably gonna overreact you know and, now, and when i say overreact I, go ahead for the listener what you're saying is those that's the reaction that your brain and body are are putting out i want people to understand you're not like flipping out throwing shit in no, the, no 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 nothing shit. violent but that's no. the i'm the same way from the way i grew up like if I'm cool, cool, cool. And then it's like, I want to smash. And right. I don't. I don't <laughs> you feel it coming. It's that volcano. It's fixing to erupt. And you're like, I need to get out of the situation. I'm fixing yeah. to lose my shit. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think people, <laughs> they, they watch that and they go, oh man, she's psycho or she's a bitch or that guy's a, a, a lunatic or an asshole. No, that's literally my brain saying, I don't want you to hurt me. And I don't, and I'm going to stop you. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, I've had a few people like I walk away from a situation because I need to, and they'll chase me down because they're not done having a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I've I'm done slammed... now. I know for real, I'm done. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, I've 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 slammed one or two doors in people's faces for their own protection, you know. Because I'm, and then later I will tell them when I tell you I'm done and I need to walk away. Trust me when I tell you, you need to let me do it. Mm -hmm. I'm not ignoring you. I'm not blowing you off. I'm going to cool off so that I can have a productive conversation with you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I think so, now we're starting to see a lot of uh, research and authors and people writing and talking about things like emotional intelligence, which is a you know turn off to a lot of guys like I don't want to read about emotions, but our emotions <laughs> are the barometer of what's going on in us. And I think a lot of people not just anger, joy or sadness or any of these very basic fundamental things that we try to codify are 
primal things happening inside of us. And you wire up something like, like abuse or something and things get skewed. It's, um, it's, it creates for an interesting adult, but I think you got to start to come in contact with that or become aware of it so that then when you feel things, you can step back and say, okay, that makes me feel this way. Why? And now, you know, that's, now we're talking Mm -hmm. therapy and things of that nature, but I think that's the point you got to get to. Yeah. And I think for me, and I, well, I can, I think I can speak for a lot of people because I've heard other people say this, you know, one of the most beneficial things of, of, of the, some of the therapy I went through was learning what my triggers were. Mm. I mean, I never knew the cigarette smoke, the odor of cigarette smoke was a trigger for me. Interesting. I just, I just thought I hated smoking. I just thought I hated the, the odor of cigarette smoke, but my mom to this day, um, is, is still the chain smoker and her health sucks. And I've been nagging her my entire life, you know, about her cigarette smoking. But in my adult years, um, I was vicious to my mom. And when I say vicious, I, I am not the violent type. I'm vicious verbally. Right. And I can be really, really mean when I lose my temper and I don't, and then I have, then I feel guilty about how I was. So then it's just two, you know, twofold, but anyway, so, um, when I learned that uh, cigarette smoking was one of my triggers, um, it, it hurt because I thought about it and realized I had taken out a lot of my aggressions on my mom because of her smoking. Mm. Now, she wasn't the cause of the reason cigarettes were a trigger for me. She had nothing to do with it, but she's a big part of my life and she smokes. So every time I smelled it on her, I, or she would light one up, I, I would just like berate her. It was, it was horrible. I was awful to her. And I felt, I mean, I just cried and I apologized and I said, I didn't know what I was doing and I'm so sorry. And she actually was um, relieved because she now understood that it wasn't her that I was mad at. It was Mm -hmm. a situation that unfortunately she was just the punching bag. So when we came to that agreement, I finally opened up to her and I told her mom, you know, listen, this is why I freaked out on you every time you, you smoked. I said, I just didn't know it until now. Right. Had that aha moment. And now it's easier for both of us because she still smokes, right. That hasn't changed, but I can say, mom, I can smell the smoke. And she'll go, oh, sorry. And she'll put it out instead of me. Oh, my God. Blah, 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 and then going off about the smoke and then her lashing out at me. Well, I'm a grown ass woman. I can do whatever I want, you know. And, right. you know, so instead of an argument, I can simply say, Mom, I can smell the smoke. And she understands what that means for me. And she'll go, oh, I'm so sorry. And she'll put it out and, you know, do her little thing. But um, at least just knowing that and understanding that that's a trigger, it's easier for me to control it rather than just lose my shit and lose my temper, right? And I think for a lot of people, they find out what their triggers are. It could be, it's an, for a lot of people, it's odors because our odor is, our sense of smell is closely related to our, our memory bank in our brain. Um, so it's odors are a huge trigger for a lot of people. Um, Thanks, make me think of my mom. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, it, odor. Of the five senses, that is the one that's closely related to your memory bank. So you can oh. smell a certain smell and it'll immediately bring a memory back. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, uh, that was, that was, that was very good because like I said, there's no cure for PTs. I well, experts argue this. Okay. I personally don't believe there's any cure for PTSD. I think we can't undo our experiences. We can't, can't undo our traumas, but we can learn and we can learn to manage it. And I think that's the key. It's just learning to manage it, knowing that, okay, some people it's crowds. They can't go into crowds. Um, Some people it's fireworks. You know, if you know that a certain situation is going to trigger you, you need to avoid it. I would agree with that. I mean, you're never going to, especially if it's trauma that happened at a young age, that stuff is wired into the, to the network that is your, your brain's operating system. But I have also found like myself, I suffered from anxiety into my mid to late twenties. I mean, debilitating anxiety. Mm -hmm. I always went to work and did things, but I would, I'd have panic attacks out of the blue. And I'd be like, I don't even know what the hell's triggering this. Like I'm just out in the sunshine. Like I'm having, my heart's doing 190 beats a minute. But once I became like super cognizant of 
what a panic attack was, this physiological action in my body. And I understood like all of these things that had happened in my life and the, what they were together, all of a sudden, the slightest symptom, I would, I could be cognizant of it and say, okay, that is this physiological thing, not all the other shit that is a 20 years or 15 years of living, I had created it to be. And all of mm -hmm. a sudden, it's just like, oh, that's really not anything. And sometimes I, uh, you know, kind of feel you feel stupid when you realize that about a thing, and like, man, I spent a lot of time investing energy into this stuff. Yeah, not really that big a deal. So I think that I, I, I'm concurring with you. But in a sense, you can, I haven't had any such instance in decade or longer, uh, two decades almost now. But um, that, of course, is not the same for everybody. And mm -hmm. our, our experiences are different. But yeah, I don't think even the broken bone, you look at it under an x ray, and there's still all the the uh, scar, scar tissue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's still evidence still there. Stronger. Yeah. It, um, you know, and I think the difference between a lot of people who went through traumatic stuff as a kid, you know, once they turn in theory, once they turn 18, they get out on their own, they create their own lives. Um, I think that especially if they get help and counseling, they can close that chapter. Right. And they can, and move on to a better one. At least I hope, I hope that's the case. I've um, known too many adults that are pretty effed up. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, no, I agree. But I mean, I'm talking about the ones that, you know, are able to get help and, and work past it. Like you were just talking sure. about with your anxiety. Right. But I think the difference between, and this is the difference between PTSD and veterans, between veterans and first responders, you know, veterans know that the crap that they saw and experienced, you know, it happened in another country far, far away. And it was a, a what they call acute. It was usually, I, I don't want to say one, because I know a lot of guys saw multiple horrible I things. I know what you mean, but it's good that we explain that to the listener. It was an acute, like a bee sting versus being exposed to something Chronic. over and over like you and law enforcement. That's yeah. exactly it. And in first responders, you know, for us, it's chronic. I haven't seen one suicide. I've seen a bunch of suicides. I haven't seen one homicide. I've seen a bunch of homicides. I haven't had one child death. I've worked. I've worked several. And it, it's, it's just, um, it's a matter of time before the straw comes along that bakes the camel's back. And that straw could be really minor. People go, oh my God, that wasn't even that bad of a call. But that was that last call for that person. And it might have triggered something that was much worse from the past that they managed to compartmentalize and put away. But then that straw broke open Pandora's box and all the demons came flying out at once. That was, that's what happened to me. I compartmentalized a lot of crap and then one event. You, well, you overloaded the computer. There was no more. I did. I did. I think the other thing that the general public maybe forgets, you know, I, I'm a, I train a lot of law enforcement. I'm an EMT. I don't work in EMS, but I've worked in emergency room and done things like that. Um, so I'm a, I can, I can advocate to people when I listen uh, to maybe folks saying like, ah, you know, that guy works in a great suburb. Not a lot goes on there. Like you said, go peel a eight year old off the road or go find Mr. Smith who smoked himself in the living room and his brains are on the ceiling. Like to most people, mm -hmm. they'd never see anything like that because in this modern world, we've completely insulated we don't bury our dead. We don't kill our food. If dad blows his brains out, you don't go in there. You call the cops. The cops call the coroner. I'm not telling this to you, but to the people listening. And you are you don't even clean it up. Aftermath comes and cleans up your house. The painter comes out from the insurance company. You're probably going to move because, God forbid, you live there anymore after that happens. Yeah. And we're just completely separated. Even... Then when they die, you don't bathe them. You don't clean them up. You pay somebody a few grand to wash them down and put them in a suit and make them smell good. So we're so insulated from that. And yep. then add insult to injury, even small town cops and firefighters or people working in an ER, your sleep patterns are You're not, your, your cortisol levels are through the roof. You, you're yeah. not working the way you're supposed to like as a system and then you do get to sleep and now a call comes out and you're out running around and adrenaline levels spike and yeah there's a reason that 
in EMS and law enforcement, even people that aren't self-medicating, they have higher instances of heart disease and, and mm -hmm. cardiovascular related diseases. It's bad stuff. They passed a bill in Florida. We've got the heart and lung bill now for, for first responders because it's proven that our jobs for firefighters, it's lung disease and for, for cops, it's heart disease because of the stress. And, and like you just described, you know, that, that zero to 60 adrenaline rush and, and the stress that the job carries and the responsibility that the job carries. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's rough, you know, and, and, uh, I, you said something a second ago, I was going to say, um, oh, uh, you talk about, you know, the death calls. I, I was, you just, I can't think of how many times I've, I've, I've sat and told a family member, just trust me, don't go in there. I'm doing mm -hmm. you a favor. Remember them the way they were. You don't want this to be your last visual, you know? And cause you know, we've, we've, I've gotten in physical fights with distraught family members trying to get into a crime scene that, you know, number one, for legal reasons, we can't let them in, but putting that aside, for their own they, good. They want they want to be with their loved one. They want for their own them. good. And you're yeah. trying to convince them, trust me, trust me, you don't want to go in there, you know, but they don't understand we're we're trying to look out for them. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it just uh, it's rough. Um, I think that I think the important thing for general population listening is soldiers, cops, whatever you are you're still a human and all of our brains and bodies work the same way. So it's hard for people to understand. Uh, I don't actually really rephrase it. It's not hard to understand if you actually just look at the simple tale of the tape, like, yeah, I never really thought about it that way. Like I've right. never read to go scoop up, you know, parts oh, of yeah. the train track or, or whatever. Yeah. 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 And then, and then what kills me, oh, now you're going to get me on a rant. Here you go. You want to, you want a rant? Okay. I don't and what, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, for all you parents listening out there. Uh -oh. um, so, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've had a parent of a, of a kid teenager. eat his breakfast. Uh, well, no, that, that's a whole nother ball game right there. But no, a parent, get, you can't talk to my son that way, or you can't, you know, why did you yell at my daughter? Um, because they were doing something really dangerous, and I've picked up one too many dead kids. So I'm actually trying to teach them not to do that. But instead of the parent understanding that I'm actually trying to protect their child, I'm the bad guy for trying to help. And they don't understand that, you know, when we yell at their children, okay, maybe we do get a little bit hard on them. That's, that's, that's possible, right? But I'm not the, okay, little Johnny, we don't do that, blah, 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 blah. especially with a teenager. That doesn't work, yeah. right? Um, so we have to like really like amp up our, 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 our emotions get us because we want this kid to, this boneheaded kid to understand, you know, don't do that. Because number one, you could get killed. I don't want to be the one to tell your parents that you're dead or how you died. And I definitely don't want to see that again, right? They don't understand that we're parents too. We have kids too. And we think, oh my God, what if it was my kid? You know, that thought, I don't care what anybody says, that thought always goes through their head. What if it was my kid? What if I, I, what if I got that phone call one day? Because yeah. we're not robots. Like you said, we're humans. We've got emotions too. And I wish parents would stop, you know, looking at it like, oh, the mean cop yelled at my kid and look at, well, why did the mean cop yell at your kid? Was your kid doing something to hurt themselves or that could get somebody else hurt, that could ruin the rest of their life? There was a life lesson there. And as parents, they missed the opportunity to, to, for the kid to, to learn a life lesson. I'm not talking about putting them in handcuffs and hauling off to jail. That's the last thing I ever want to do. We do it because we have to, but it's not what we want to do. Trust me. Mm -hmm. It's always a last resort. But getting in their face and yelling at them like a drill instructor, if it'll send a message that might save their life down the road, I'll do it. I don't have a problem mm -hmm. with that. I do it to my own kid. Why wouldn't I do it to somebody else's? So I say shit to my kid. <laughs> I think that's, I think there's plenty of parents that, I, I, let me rephrase that. I think the kind of parents that probably are okay with that probably don't have the kids getting yelled at. I mean, it, it happens. My parents mm -hmm. would, were quite all right with the cops yelling at me if I did something. I remember getting pulled over once speeding in town and um, well, local copper gave me a ration of shit about it. But um, it's, I think the big scheme of things, it is become definitely the norm to just disregard uh, authority. 
That's mm -hmm. you know, the, the undercurrent in our nation right now. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with, with what's going on in our nation and has been going on for probably about the last, oh, almost a decade now. Is that, yeah. no, not a decade. Yeah, a decade. It's um, been a while. It's been yeah. building. Yeah, it has been. So um, it's just been continuously getting worse. And, you know, we're having to guard every little thing that we do. And that's really hard when you have a job that causes you to react in the heat of the moment. You have to make split life, life deciding, you know, life or death split to second decisions. Um, not that I we do that every that day. On the public, though. The mm -hmm. public has, has requested that our local law enforcement and EMS take care of every f thing. Uh, there's a, there's a mm -hmm. tree branch down in the road. There's a cat in a tree. There's a, <laughs> uh, we need a law enforcement officer in every school. There's uh, my kid won't get up for school. That's my favorite one. Natural gas in my house, you know, like call a damn plumber and I'm not all the gas company. That, yeah. Yeah. But like we, now we call my kid won't get up for school. I've told this story on this podcast before a local deputy friend of mine would get called out. He won't put his shirt on. Mom would call. He, he's 10 oh years old. He won't put his shirt on. And he won't, he won't eat his breakfast and the bus is going to be here in 10 minutes. And eventually she got fined for misuse of 911. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's pretty darn interesting. But that's not the police fault because you're just doing what we, the people, have asked of you and employed you to do. So like people have, have expected way too much just like somebody to come carry their dead loved one off and package meat nice and clean without any blood for them. Do yep. everything for me. Yep. No, it's uh, it has definitely gotten a little ridiculous out there for sure. You know, and then what kills or cracks me up is people, don't you have anything better to do? Yeah, actually I do, but you called. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm getting paid for this. And if you listen to this podcast, you'll hear that it, gets me adrenalized and I enjoy it. So that's why I'm here. You said it though, <laughs> not me. I'm kidding. How do people find your book? They can find my book on my website, www.courageously-broken.com. Uh, or it can be found on Amazon as well as through uh, Nook um, and any of the major retail stores and it can be ordered. But if they order it directly from me, um, I will sign it and ship it. And it includes, you know, shipping taxes at the total price. And also 10% of my proceeds are going to nonprofit organizations that are helping veterans and first responders um, with PTSD. Because I'm all about getting, you know, I'm all about getting to the cause and not just throwing a pill at it. You know, I, I don't I like that. Yeah, I, I'd rather treat the problem and not the symptoms. I dig it. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to talk and uh, share some of the story. I'll have to order up a copy myself and get it get it read up final parting words if people that are listening or watching never had the opportunity to meet you in person what would you leave them with first impressions i come across as stubborn but then once somebody gets to know me they realize i have a really good heart and i'm just incredibly passionate and i and i'm always there to help anybody i can i dig it well, I'm glad that we got to do this and take the time. And I hope that folks purchase your book and that story is uh, meaningful and impactful to the people that, that it needs to be. How's that? Sounds great. I'd love it. For you guys that have watched, if this podcast was helpful to you, share it on Facebook or on whatever social media circles that you're in. If there is a guest that you'd like to have on, shoot us a message to training at carrytrainer.com and we will consider it. And as always, don't be dickheads. Nobody <laughs> likes a dickhead. Amen. Peace out. Visit our website, carrytrainer.com for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Carry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at carrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com.
Hey Steve, what do you think of Gunfighter Gun Oil? Well Mick, I have to show you about that. Gunfighter, Gunfighter Lube Baby, I had the Gunfighter Gunfighter Blue But then I got me some Gunfighter Gunfighter Lube Let me tell you about it I'm Made in the USA Amazing lubricity Amazing adhesion, baby A hundred percent synthetic But it's gonna last ya Gunfighter, gunfighter, gun or baby Took away my gunfighter blue I'm still working on it, but you... Oh, yeah. So you like the lube? 